Farmers have always valued the natural resources. If you look at the first settlers, you know, they'd choose where they'd settle next to the waterways and they'd look at the country, whether it was good timber, and that represented good soil, so that was where they would set up to grow food. So it has always been acknowledged as really valuable. Um, I'm going to share my story today about my work with a number of brands and also working with consumers to actually promote what farmers are doing to produce quality food but also their passion and commitment to the environment. Uh, we're farming in South Gippsland. Uh, hands up here who's been, who knows where South Gippsland is? Anyone been here? To, yep. So beautiful part, almost the southernmost point of mainland Australia. Um, as far as natural resources, my grandfather was responsible for developing a number of that, fair bit of that country. It was actually so poor that the first developers came out. They came to the Tarwin River. They looked out and they just saw this coastal scrub and they said there's not enough grass to feed a bullock, they turned away and left it. Um, so it was really only cleared a lot of that country in the 50s and 60s. Um, if you put cattle out there without fertiliser, after about three months they'd get coastal disease and they'd, they'd uh, get sick and they'd die. Because we were deficient in copper, cobalt and selenium that was critical for that animal's health. So science has been really important for us to actually utilise some of our land areas when we actually look at what's required for plant growth, what's required for animal growth, and of course, producing healthy food for humans. So science has actually been import important for us developing a lot of Australia to, to produce it sustainably. Um, on our farm, we've got beef and sheep, but uh, in the last four or five years, we've been working with agritourism as well. When Paul turned 50, we had a bit of a um, tour around uh, the world and we were very impressed in Europe with the agritourism. And you went to Italy and France um, and everywhere you went there were these farmers communicating about their food and telling the story of the culture and their history. And we, it struck us there was very little opportunities. We had some great food and wine businesses but getting those stories in Australia, we didn't have that same opportunity. And the disconnect in Australia with all our population living in the cities, people don't have that connection with the farm anymore. So we decided that we might start uh, telling the story from the region and the great region. Gippsland's not recognised as a great food region because we don't have a three hat restaurant there, but we are producing incredible food because we have reliable rainfall. And it's really fantastic to talk to people that come on the farm to tell them the story, the science that underpins agriculture and the importance of monitoring what we're doing so that we can actually improve that resource base. Um, so it's been a really interesting exercise to go through. Um, 19 years ago, the industry, uh, the meat and livestock industry, developed a fantastic system called Meat Standards Australia, which is a quality insurance system to guarantee tender meat. Um, at that time, they'd done a survey and about 50% of the time when people bought meat, it would be tough and 50% of the time it would be tender. And they had a system through the whole supply chain that we could guarantee and improve that quality of that product. And we saw enormous opportunity for producers to actually get a bigger slice of the share of the dollars. If we could actually be involved in this, develop a branded product that came off from our area, we're producing grass-fed beef, let's underpin it by MSA. Um, so we developed a brand called Gippsland Natural Brief, um, and it's still going today, underpinned by MSA. We started going to um, farmers' markets to get some feedback and to develop our marketing material. And one of the things was people perceived, because we said it was natural, they perceived that it was organic. Now, we weren't organic. They were actually natural because the calves were being born in the paddock and they're romping around a paddock and, and then they're going from grass-fed to you. But we weren't organic. Um, but when we did farmer profiles, every single farmer was very involved in land care. Every single farmer was actually focused on best practice, um, being, environment, being profitable, but also looking at their environmental footprint. They'd protected their waterways, they were protecting bush, they were monitoring soils. So we thought, I wonder if there's an opportunity to market, you know, get a green stamp for what we're doing. And at that time, EMS became trendy around the 2000s. And the federal government was investing in environmental management systems. Meat and Livestock Australia was interested in doing a pilot. So we got involved with a pilot program. We were concerned about stuffing up our brand, Gippsland Natural, so we thought we'd create a new brand called EnviroMeat. Um, and we put 60 producers through Gippsland through an ISO 14001 EMS um, to supply this brand. And again, very interesting exercise going through it. Um, so with the 
EMS, um, the process, the first step, and it really links, I think, to some of the things that uh, you've been saying around what's needed, is look at the impact of the activities of the farming that's going on and develop procedures to manage those impacts, reduce the risk. So we could identify for a grazing enterprise this grazing pressure and, um, and actually having bare ground is a big risk. Soil and fertiliser, we want to see that we're improving the soils. Um, we look at, need to look at fertilisers that we're not wasting and going into waterways. We need to look at biodiversity and that we're enhancing biodiversity and we're not losing it. Uh, we need to look at weeds and pests. We need to look at water, chemical use and greenhouse gas. So they are all the areas that we need to monitor, the things that you're monitoring as well. Um, and what we needed to do is each year monitor what's happening. So for a lot of the farmers, this monitoring was one of the challenges. How do you measure it? Well, um, soil testing is a fairly easy one for soils. How do we monitor the condition of waterways? What's there and how do we do that? What do we look at with biodiversity? So that connects us to some of the scientists that are doing it and increase our knowledge with what we're doing, looking at habitat hectares. Um, so it was a really interesting exercise. Um, when we look at natural capital or financial capital, if you make a bad decision, your cash flow will tell you what's happening and you can lose money very quickly with bad decisions. But I think as James was saying, if we make some bad decisions on our natural capital, for example our soils or our bush, it's a generally a very slow process and sometimes you can't even see it. For example, when we started our EMS, um, Paul and I are farming on our family farm, we had areas of bush, particularly this swampy land that the turned the first explorers away, I actually didn't think our grazing was impacting on it. I'd seen no change over my lifetime. But because the EMS demanded us to think, you know, to, to challenge our thinking and what is best practice, we actually fenced one bit of the bush off and we quickly saw the understory completely changing. And because it had always been that way, I thought that was the way it was. So we actually need to be monitoring and actually uh, having good science and challenging what we're doing because we think what we're doing is all right, but it's not necessarily. So that challenging process is very, very important. So with Gippsland Natural, we linked with SAI Global. We had an auditing system. Um, it was a significant cost involved. But the consumers didn't even know what an EMS was. Consumers still weren't demanding this. So over time, it was actually very hard. We, as farmers, um, are doing the right thing, involved through land care. We wanted to document it. We wanted to make sure we weren't greenwashing with our brand. But the consumers weren't demanding that. So, um, so we didn't maintain the external auditing. We did some peer auditing, but we dropped it back because if the consumers weren't wanting it. But over time, and, and the brand, we went from a co-op, because one of the things with the co-op, we were a bit risk adverse, so it was hard to take all the opportunities, and we had three of the producers buy it, Bill Bray, Bob Davies, and Paul Croc, and they've actually been driving the brand, taking risks, and it's still going from strength to strength. Um, take us forward about 15 years, Paul Croc keeps saying to me, we still, and what they saw the value, the Gippsland natural brand had more value because people connected to the regions. But they still wanted this environmental underpinning and they still wanted to make sure they could um, validate it. So I was working for Landcare and the 25 anniversary grants came up and there was funding available. And there are a number of other innovative food producers in our region. So we put our hand up to look at Let's bring an EMS back and see whether these smaller producers, what value they find. And for those people who've been involved with Gippsland Natural, 15 years down the track, is there still value in that EMS? And when I looked around, there was only one EMS brand still going, and that was the Australian Land Management Group. So I think a number of you might know Tony Gleeson. Darren Marshall delivers those programs from up in Queensland. Um, we had 11 businesses involved, and um, their system is certified land management. It actually has... Um, national recognition, and they've also brought on board animal welfare, because they say not only is environment important, but the animal welfare is very important. So um, we ran this course with 11 new producers. We had deer farmers. We had a number of people with sheep brands that were running it involved. And um, it's 12 months down the track. I brought them all together a couple of weeks ago, and all of them have found enormous value in getting involved. Um, very interesting, the pig producers, I think of free-range pig producers and I see just mess, you know, mud, pigs. Um, and this guy, in really thinking about his procedure and his activity, he also, his business, he says, he's got hogs and logs because he's also a sawmiller. 
So he's using all his wood chips, putting them where the home patch is for those pigs, and then he's rotationally grazing them round. And that home patch is where they put all their manure, and so he's getting a really rich area, and then he's spreading it out. So he's really using it effectively, and you'll go around there. Even last year was our toughest season on record in Gippsland. He still had pasture and ground cover. So it's really thinking more deeply about our systems, our resources, and setting up something that is regenerative rather than degenerative. Really, really important. So um, these farmers... What, what it does is we all have plans with natural resources, but we get busy doing the work, and sometimes these things slip. So by having the EMS in place, it means that we're actually making those actions a priority, and we've sought significant action. Most of it, I think all of it actually, was self-funded by the producers rather than relying on land care funding or other funding, whether it's shelter belts, pastures re improved water infrastructure, um, double fencing boundaries from an animal biosecurity point of view. The value of the procedures, particularly the new farmers that got involved, um, the, the pig farmer, he could not believe by documenting everything he did when he started employing staff on the farm, they knew automatically what happened. Uh, the big corporates do it, but often on these family farms we haven't documented our systems. But actually, if we have a sustainable system in place, or if we're thinking about it, if we can write it down, it makes it much easier to transfer it. So it can save an enormous amount of time. The other thing with the changing climate, we're, we're told we're going to be having more of these extreme events. And so we really need to protect. You know, we spend all this time protecting our bush and planting shelter, and the shelter makes such a difference to the livestock welfare from a shade and shelter point of view. And then if it all goes up in smoke, and the floods that come through and you've got these beautiful perennial pastures and they get devastated. So thinking about how we can manage those risks and the reality is they're going to be happening more often is very, very important. And then if we can actually, when the disasters do happen, monitor what happened and, and then change it again, it's, it's really quite important for us to be able to do that. So we're having systems in place. But I loved this pig farmer. He got so much out of it. Um, and they're terrific. So Amber Creek pigs. He said, I love it that... You know, I can have a consumer at any time ring me up, they can come to the farm and I can show them round and they're just stoked to see good animal and land management. I mean, you know when you've got guests around, you've got to tidy up, you've got to race around and tidy up the rooms in case they're coming in the living room. Well, we really need Australian agriculture that it's in order all the time because our consumers are the general public, we've got overseas people, we can't afford to see disastrous animal welfare things, we can't afford to see degraded waterways. The impact that has on you as a consumer or an investor is significant. So we really do need every Australian farmer to be being proactive around this. So there's enormous value, it's not just the people that are selling branded product, it's for all of agriculture that it's, that it's very, very important. So can we rely on the consumer to save the planet and to drive all this? Um, of course, we had the big wave of green bags and everyone likes to see with their green bags. Everyone's really embarrassed if they're caught with their plastic bags nowadays. Um, there's been some studies been going on for a long time now. Um, Victorian Department did one beyond price and quality in 2004. Um, and they said that at the moment that uh, the environment's low, but it's going to become important in the future. Another study in 2007, Beyond Credence, international, they surveyed lots of international markets, they said the same thing. Um, if you're looking at environment, they're actually more thinking about things like food miles, um, uh, carbon neutral, sort of quite trendy there for a while, ethical food, um, corporate social responsibility. Um, but still, a study done um, by Meat and Livestock Australia just recently looked at when people are purchasing meat, what's important? And it's still price, freshness, quality. It doesn't matter what your product is, it's always the same. Consumer wants quality, they want it reasonably priced. And the environment, only 1.7% of people with this more recent study said the environment would influence their buying decisions. So we can't rely on the consumer to drive this change because a lot of them can't afford to. Um, and a lot of them choose about where they spend their money. So they say they'd like to, they like to be seen to be green, but they're actually not necessarily following through with that. So we really need to think about who is driving it. Now, I think many farmers are very committed to that. I think 
To date, the state and federal governments have invested significantly around our natural resource management through land care, through a lot of their investments over years. Um, and I think it's quite appropriate that they have because the public benefits when we have clean water. Um, keeping biodiversity in trees, we're creating clean air. Um, it's really, really important that we continue to do that. So really what our brands are doing is it's farmers telling the stories to the consumers about what's happening on farm. And I think that's really important. And I know most of the industry bodies are trying to empower and enable their producers to do that. There's a lot of workshops on social media um, and there's lots now happening in, in Facebook and Twitter where farmers are communicating about what they're doing. Um, Gippsland Natural, we've been involved at the Melbourne Tennis for the last three years. We've had Gippsland Natural burgers and these monstrous lines. This last year was the first time we actually had it in one of the high-class restaurants. So again, on the menu is the Gippsland Natural and we're trying to tell the story with that. Um, two weeks ago, Menion had their first garlic festival. 7,000 people came to Menion and Gippsland Natural was set up and we've now connected with a couple of um, top chefs. Um, and Stephanie Alexander here is, is Facebooking out about Gippsland Natural. And that's an Amber Creek, that's our Dan, the pig farmer, that's his pork on a spit and there's our beef. So the stories around sustainable farming, farming that are trying to do it, we're trying to link into those foodies uh, so that they're aware and, and they can connect with the consumer and what's going on. But poor management of our natural resources has huge consequences. Um, farmers are at the interface. We have a footprint across most of Australia we're the front line for weeds and pests, and the damage they can cause are enormous. I mean, early, early farmers, you speak to any old, old farmers with rabbits, and when they came and the enormous impact that they've had. And farmers um, are there dealing with it every day. And farmers are the ones that can be monitoring. And it's really important, I think, that we connect to people like James and the, and the National Framework that we use the same language. So there's enormous opportunities there um, around that. So, Australian farmers take great pleasure in providing sustainable food. For us, environment, environmental management is an integral part of good business management. Thank you.